Здравствуйте, товарищи. Welcome back to Russian Through Poems and Paintings, we're on day 153, and we're closing out our discussion of Russian verbs of position. And so today we'll finally add the third, fill in the third column for putting things into a position, and also note a couple of other things about the about how these verbs are used. Uh, let's start out with a painting, uh, an interesting historical event here, the Kranatsi Nikolai Tarova and Alexandri Fyodorovny. Uh, so this is obviously the last Russian Tsar, as you hopefully know, right, being, uh, right during his coronation, Kranatsia. Uh, and let's just supply a little caption here. Nikolai Stanovitsa Tsarium Rasiske Imperii v Uspienskom Saborie Moskovskova Kremlia. So Nicholas assumes a standing position as Tsar of the... Okay, that sounds weird, right? Okay, so that leads us to our first topic today. One of uh, one verb we've learned already, stanovitsa stat, that we learned, you know, its most literal meaning is to assume a standing position. It can also mean a couple of other things. And one of those is to become, right? So very, very important meaning. And you see how it's translated here with the, it's combined here with the instrumental. Now, we've actually seen this verb before in that meaning. You may think back all the way book to, all the way back to book one. Uh, we When we introduced the instrumental case, we, supplied this verb and we used it in the sense of to become. And then it's one of those instances where we, we don't have an identity statement, right? The, the predicate noun is not a statement of identity, as in uh, Nicholas II is Tsar, but rather he's becoming. And then we get Tsaryom, right? The instrumental for what he's becoming, right? So we translate this, Nicholas is becoming here in this painting, the Tsar of the Russian Empire in the Dormition Cathedral, the Uspensky Sabor of the Moscow Kremlin. Uh, maybe you don't know that uh, despite the capital being moved to Petersburg and despite uh, starting with Peter the, the Great, all of the uh, Tsars being buried there in Petersburg, um, in the, the, the church there in the Petropavlovsky Krepis, the Peter and Paul Fortress, the Russian Tsars continue to be coronated in Moscow in one of the old uh, cathedrals there in the little in the church complex of the Moscow Kremlin. So if you visit the Kremlin today, you can visit all of these churches. There are at least three major ones uh, there, and this Uspensky Sabor is one of them. Uh, there's another church nearby where um, most of the Tsars, or, well, many of them pre-Peter uh, the Great were buried, and a lot of other really interesting historical figures. Okay, anyway, uh, so let's look at a couple of examples here with uh, Stanovitsa Stats, right? Now, we mentioned the other day that it's not really heard all that often in its basic meaning of to assume a standing position, right? We mentioned how so often the verb stavach, stats, which literally means to, to, to assume a standing position upward, right? That is to stand up, to arise or whatever, uh, is, is often used instead. And so that leaves us with two other meanings of Stanovitsa Stats, which are both extremely common, uh, extremely common. Um, uh, so the first is, as we mentioned, to become, followed by the instrumental, right? For example, Я изучаю медицину, я хочу стать врачом. Or Nikolai II стал последним русским царем, right? He became the last Russian Tsar. Okay, the other meaning, uh, which I'm not sure we've seen, is is to be, we, we may have, though. No, I guess we did uh, in, back on day 109, right? So you may look back and review this. In any case, stanovitsa uh, stats can be followed by an infinitive uh, and mean to begin, right? To begin to do something. And in that sense, it's a synonym of uh, another verb, nechinait, nechait, which I dare say in, in modern Russian is maybe a bit more common, although it's kind of hard to say, um, uh, you know, in, in terms of how do you say to, to start doing something in Russian. I think nechinait, nechait is maybe more more ordinary nowadays in speech. Stanovitsa stats maybe a little bit more formal, but it's kind of hard to say. They're, they're basically synonyms. Um, uh, I've noticed just lately, by the way, I've been translating Golgo for this reader I'm doing, and, uh, you know, he, you see these, in both meanings, you see Stanovitsa Stat all the time back in, in classic literature. So, anyway, uh, let's look at some examples. Почему стал изучать русский язык? Why did you begin to study Russian, uh, the Russian language? Uh, I wouldn't even begin to study such a difficult language. And that's a slightly different little um, construction there. Uh, it's kind of like in English we say in kind of colloquial English, like I'm not about to do that, like I, meaning I, I have absolutely no intention of doing that. 
this is kind of a good Russian equivalent, right, with Stotts. Я бы не стал, right? I wouldn't even begin to do whatever. В России становится холодать уже в сентябре. Right in Russian, it begins to get cold already in September. Я не стану с тобой об этом спорить сейчас. Okay, there's that other slightly different meaning. I'm not about to argue about this with you right now, right? I'm, I don't want to talk about it. Uh, one little detail in terms of aspect you may recall is that when we use an infinitive after verbs, meaning to begin or to end, right, to start or to stop doing whatever, the infinitive has to be imperfective. That's an ironclad rule. And if you think about uh, the logic of it, it makes perfect sense, right? You're, you're st what you're starting or stopping is a process, sort of by definition, right? Something that has a beginning or an, and an end, right? And so while the verb to begin or to end itself can be either, right? Uh, it can, like, for example, I began versus I was beginning or and so forth. Uh, so the verb itself can be either aspect, but the infinitive that follows it has to be imperfective, right? So, for example, why did you begin to study the Russian language? Well, your study is the process, right? And we're talking here specifically about its beginning. Uh, but anyway, Zuchait is um, imperfective there. Okay, so some good review there. And uh, again, uh, in terms of just major items of vocab, th these these meanings of stanovitsa stait are extremely important. Uh, and again, I've just been reminded of that lately, just kind of paying careful attention as I'm translating. Uh, again, Google, but it, it doesn't matter. It could be Dostoevsky, it could be anyone. Um, okay, so uh, finally, let's fill in the third column uh, of our uh, table of verbs of position. And again, let's just be really careful to review this because this is one of those things, kind of like verbs of motion, where it's easy to just kind of say, oh, it doesn't really matter. They all mean more or less the same thing. Well, of course they don't, right? And that's that's the point, right? So remember, we have the four positions, uh, standing, lying, sitting, hanging. And for each position, we have kind of three the three columns, right? The first verb, for which there was only one infinitive, an imperfective, describe being in a position, right? So because it's that description of a state, right? Uh, not really an action or, or a process or anything that's leading anywhere, right? It's, it's imperfective only. Okay, so we could unpack th those verbs again. For example, to be in a sitting position or to be in a standing position. And those would combine or they could combine with a gidia, right? To tell where you are in a standing position. Okay, then yesterday we added uh, a new, a verbs that would agree with kuda, right? Uh, meaning to assume the position, right? So to assume a standing position, we should we should imagine that in the sense of sort of moving into a position, right? And because of this idea of motion, kuda, in Russian, we would get a kuda expression, for example, uh, to stand into the line, if you remember that uh, little idiom or to sit onto a chair, onto a sofa, or whatever. Uh, okay, now today, similarly, we have a new uh, aspect of appearance, meaning to put something else into the position, right? We're not moving into it ourselves, but we're taking something and putting it into the position. And again, we have this idea of motion, right? Uh, into a position that in Russian gives us kuda. And uh, again, you see, hopefully now at this point, how Russian is making these distinctions very clearly, right? There's really just no middle ground, uh, and so, uh, anyway, we have to be very careful. So let's look at these new infinitives. Uh, today's, uh, aren't too difficult, right? Stavits, pastavits. Those are e-verbs meaning to put into a standing position. Kleist, palajit means to put into a lying position. That is to lay something, right? To lay something on the table, for example. Uh, now note that the obstruent, right? We don't see those every day. Kleist. And we see that that's in stress. Okay, ask yourself, can you predict the conjugation there? Well, just supply the, the final de in the stem and, and add your endings, and we get kladu, kladyosh, kladyot, etc. The past tense, by the way, would be klal. Right? So uh, a somewhat peculiar verb there. Anyway, palajit, uh, e-verb, palaju, palojish, etc. Shifting stress. Okay, the next verb, sajaj uh, posadit, the pair means to put into a sitting position. This can also mean to plant something. 
сажать, which is an I verb, right? Сажаю, сажаешь. And посадить, uh, which is an E verb, shifting stress. Посажу, посадишь, посадят. What would be the third plural? Посадят, right? Посадят with the я. Okay, so as always, when you're encountering these new verbs, see if you know the pattern, right? Uh, always don't, you know, don't miss any chance to review those conjugation patterns. Finally, to put into a hanging position, вешать, вешаю, вешаешь, right, an I verb, and повесить, right, повешу, повесишь, etc. Uh, now, again, you might want to review in the book there a bit more carefully these, these English verbs to lie and to lay, right, which can confuse even people who know better, right? Uh, so watch out for that. And again, it may help you improve your English slightly, at least in, a, in terms of formal English. Uh, but again, in Russian, the distinction is crystal clear, right? For example, лежать, if we think a couple of days back, that means to be in a lying position. That's to lie, right? He is lying in bed, right? Uh, now I'll compare that to today's verb class, palajit, that means to lay, right? Uh, he is laying the book onto the table. He laid the book onto the table or whatever. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Книга лежит на столе. The book is lying on the table. Книга лежала на столе. The book lay on the table. Okay, so you see how confusing this is, right? Lay, that's that could be present tense for to put into a lying position in English or past tense for to assume a lying position, right? Or, or sorry, to, to be in a lying position, I should say. So, книга лежала на столе, the book lay on the table. Я кладу, or was lying on the table, we could say. Я кладу книгу на стол, I am laying the book on the table. Я положил книгу на стол, I laid the book on the table. Okay, so there's some, a bit of really more English review than Russian uh, review. But now keep in mind how, again, it, when you're just starting to learn these, it may be better to unpack these a little bit. Let's do that quickly. Книга лежит на столе. The book is in a lying position on the table. Книга лежала на столе. The book was in a lying position on the table. Я кладу книгу на стол. I am placing the book into a lying position onto the table, literally, right? Куда? Я положил книгу на стол. I, I put the book into a lying position onto the table, literally. So again, I think maybe uh, if we unpack those very literally and very carefully, it can help us really uh, zero in on the, on the meaning of the Russian. Okay, so let's um, let's do a few of these, and we're, we're going to kind of do what we did yesterday. We're going to start out talking about putting things into a position, and then we're going to describe the position they're, they, they're left in after we've done the pudding. So number one, I hung my coat on the coat rack. Okay, let's think carefully. What are we really doing here? We're putting the coat into a position, right? So we're in the third column. It's a hanging position, so we're going to use pavyesit, right? Because it sounds like a one-time perfective action, right? I, I, I did it. It's over and done with. Okay, I'll assume a masculine speaker since I'm the one reading the exercise. Ya pavyesio, ya pavyesio, paltoa na vieshoku, na vieshoku. Check your text. There was a, a typo there in the stress. It's not vishalka, it's vieshalka, right? Uh, so make sure that's correct there in whatever version of the book you have. Uh, okay, number two. Uh, sorry, let's continue now. Now it's hanging on the coat rack. Okay, now we've we've placed it into a hanging position. Now it is in a hanging position on the coat rack. Tipier anoa, right? Paltoa, neuter, anoa, visit na vieshalkia. Okay, now compare again. We, ha we, we hung the coat onto the coat rack. Na vieshulku, accusative. Now it's hanging gdje. Na vieshulkia, right? Pre uh, prepositional. Okay, number two, I put the book back upright on the shelf. Okay, so we're standing it, so to speak, onto the shelf. Uh, so that's going to be stavic pastavic. And again, it looks like a one-time action here. Ja pastavil knjigu apratna na polku. Right, apratna is a little adverb meaning back, right? I put it back onto the shelf, napolku. Okay, now it's standing on the shelf. Okay, so again, as we mentioned in English, we just say, well, now it's on the shelf. Um, uh, you could say that in Russian, right? Kniga napolkia, of course, but if you're, you could also supply a um, verb of position, right? Kniga stait napolkia. Kniga stait napolkia. Okay, number three, I laid I laid the book onto the shelf. Okay, and it's going to be flat now. Okay, so now we're getting the lying position. Ya knigu 
napolku, right accusative, napolku. Now it's lying on the shelf. It is in a lying position. Tipier ana, ana, meaning the book. Tipier kniga, or tipier ana ligit na polkia. Chitiere, the waiter seated us at a table. Okay, so he's putting us into a sitting position. Uh, Aficiant posidil nas zastol uakna, or vozle akna, right? So he seated us. Remember the idiom in Russian is. P- behind the table, into a position behind the table, za plus accusative. On posadil nas za stol. Okay, now we're sitting at a table near the window. So now we're in a sitting sitting position. Tipier mi sidim za stolom. Again, remember the idiom, behind the table. Uh, instrumental there is showing uh, gidia, right? Za stolom uakna. Piet, why do you always lay your books on the floor? Okay, this is a repetitive action, present tense also, so we're going to get uh, classed, right? Why are you always placing your books into a lying position onto the floor? Почему ты всегда кладешь книги на пол? Right, why are you always putting your books onto the floor? Why are they always lying on the floor? Okay, li- they're in a lying position. Почему они всегда лежат на полу? Napalu, and you may, you may remember that pole is one of those funny masculine nouns that takes a stressed u to describe location, uh, and we would call that the this alternative locative ending, if you remember. So it's not, for example, napalia, it's napalu. Um, yeah, look at this, uh, another interesting painting, Vincania. Here's another event from the life of Nikolai Taroy. Uh, Vincania, this is a good, a good little cultural uh, tidbit here, right? Uh, Russians, you know, traditionally they would have a church wedding and the Orthodox ceremony involves a crowning, right? It's a symbolic, uh, literally a crowning, Vincania. And that word is a verbal noun that's related to, uh, ultimately to the noun de vignettes, which means a crown, uh, there's another word, carona, which is a, you know, a borrowing of vignettes is more of a, an old-fashioned, I suppose, ultimately word for crown. And so, uh, so a vincania is specifically an Orthodox wedding ceremony. It's very specific that, that, that way, right? Because obviously, almost any other wedding ceremony, I don't know of another one that involves crowning. Uh, so anyway, so the verb for that is vincatsa of vincatsa. And again, the verbal noun we get from that is vincania, a crowning. Um, so the, the another phrase for that to get married in, in, in church, basically, is stats pod vignettes. It's kind of, a, again, kind of an old-fashioned, rather specific phrase, meaning literally to assume a standing position. Uh, and then look again at the accuser. This is a kuda expression. Again, it's maybe a little bit counterintuitive for us, but it makes perfect sense when we think about it. When you're getting married in an Orthodox church, you are standing, so to speak, to a position beneath the crown, right? So it's not put vinsom, it's put vignettes. You're moving into that position beneath the crown, right? Now, uh, uh, now here's a kind of a fun expression that you still hear sometimes. Uh, to get cold feet, as we say, right? To abandon someone at the altar, the phrase for that is bijat is put vinsa, right? To run. And here, bijat, this is a somewhat special use of that verb, we would normally think of that to mean to be in underway running. It can also mean just basically to, to flee, right, to escape. And that's what it means here, right? To bijat is put vinsa, means literally to run out from under the crown. And so, again, you can imagine what that uh, literally means. Okay, let's look quickly at imperative forms of these position verbs. So here I've uh, just, I'm giving you these forms. A lot of them are a little bit funny uh, you know, there's some of those trickier imperatives because obviously some of these verb types are a bit unusual. So uh, I've laid them out here in the table. So uh, just look at a few of them. And, uh, you know, some of these are a bit weird. You would almost never use them, right? Like, hey, you get into a hanging position. You know, when would you say that exactly? Okay, so I've put the ones that are more commonly heard in bold, right? The others you can almost ignore. Um, okay, so stoy. That means basically uh, be in a standing position. Now, somewhat oddly, that can also mean stop, right? So again, maybe it's just slightly illogical. If you're if someone's running and you say, hey, you stop, you would expect maybe to say stein, right? Meaning, hey, you get into a standing position, stop. Okay, but anyway, stoy is uh, 
can mean, hey, uh, keep standing or stand, and also to stop. Okay, liji means to, hey, you lie there or keep lying there. Sidi means uh, be, literally, again, this one, this is a particularly helpful, right? Sidi means, hey, you be in a sitting position. Now, normally that would mean remain seated, right? You're already in that position because remember, we're not, this verb can't be used to tell someone to get into a sitting, sitting position. So normally it means like, hey, don't get up, you know, sidi, sidi, uh, remain si- seated. Okay, let's look at the next column. Uh, and again, just hitting the, the important ones. Lajis or liak would mean, hey, uh, lie down, right? Go to bed. Sadi <clears throat> siad. Now that one, you may that's a really common one. And you may remember we talked about this a little bit. This is one of those hospitality verbs uh, for which the, imper- the, the perfective imperative that we would normally use for everyday commands, for positive commands, in this case, siads is it sounds very impolite, right? And we kind of joke that it, it almost it's almost as harsh as saying in English, "Hey, sit your ass down," right? It really sounds pretty harsh. And so instead, in Russian, you would use the imperfective for again this polite so-called hospitality command, sadis or sadites, right? Meaning, please be seated. And I, right, and again, literally assume a sitting position, right? Assume a sitting position is what we're saying. Okay, now for putting into a position, right? Staj, pastaj. Hey, you put that into a standing position. Klaidi, palaji. Hey, you put that into a lying position. Uh, Pasaidi would mean to, hey, you, uh, you know, seat that person or whatever, or plant that seed or whatever. Okay, and finally, vieshi, pavies. Right? Hey, you go hang, go hang that up. Okay, so let's give a few uh, commands here. Uh, just translating, uh, sit, no need to get up. Okay, so again, this is going to be sidi. Sidi, right, nyanadov stavat, right? So again, that means something more like remain seated, no need to get up. And a little pastel of it's of nagach pravde niet. Literally, in feet, there is no truth. Uh, and that's just, again, a little saying, meaning, hey, remain seated, sit down, take it easy. There is no truth in feet. Okay, uh, number two, put the carpet on the floor and the table there in the corner. Okay, so we've got to think what's the position we're putting these things into. Okay, we're going to lay the carpet onto the floor, right? So, palaji, uh, kavior, napol, i pastaj, stol, tuda, vugol. Okay, we have to be careful there to get kuda uh, expressions, right? So, onto the floor, we're saying uh, napol. You know, by the way, there's just another example how English is so vague in so many ways, even when it doesn't really have to be, right? So we say on the floor almost always as opposed to onto the floor, right? So we have that we could say that onto the floor, it's good English and it, it's a little bit more accurate in the sense that it, you know, it makes this distinction of on versus on to, but we don't do that at least not anymore normally in English, right? We simply say, hey, put it on the floor. So the carpet could be lying on the floor, and we put it on the floor, and there's no clear distinction drawn. Okay, anyway, uh, and the table, right, to da, right, to that place over there, into the corner, right, vugel. Uh, three, put some more meat on his plate. Okay, when you're putting food, as you might imagine, you're putting it into a lying position on the plate. So this is a pretty common thing you'll hear in Russia, right? Palaji yumu yisho miasa would be, I think, the best way to say this. Balaji yumu, so to him, Yeshua, Myasa, right? And there we there we get a uh, a partitive genitive, right? We want some more of meat. Some more of meat. So remember you get that partitive genitive all the time when you're talking about food quantities. Um right, okay, number uh Chitiri, uh, put this book on the shelf and lay that one on the table. Okay, let's assume we're putting it upright on the shelf. Palaji, sorry, pastav, see I goofed there a little bit. Pastaj etu knigu na polku, a palaji etu na stol. Right? So, pastaj, put the first book onto the shelf, na polku, i palaji votetu, votetu knigu, or whatever, etu knigu na stol. Okay, piac, don't ever put your elbows on the table. Okay, see if you can guess what infinitive we'll use for this one. Kleist, right? Oh, okay, why imperfective? Because it's it's a negative command, right? So, remember all that stuff? 
uh, we're saying don't ever do this. It's 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 impolite. It's bad manners. Uh, it shows your poor upbringing, et cetera, et cetera. Don't ever put your elbows on the table. Okay. Uh, now, as I sit here recording this, I realize I've got both elbows on my table. So how how impolite. But there's no one in the room with me, so who cares? Right. Um, okay, number five. Uh, so, yeah. Не клади локти на стол. An elbow is a локоть. Локоть. Uh, with that mobile vowel, lokti. So, ne klaidi lokti na stol. Okay, shaste, uh, hang your hat on the hanger. Okay, now, let's assume this is a one-time command, right? Uh, so, that would be uh, pavies, right? Pavies shapku na vieshoku. Now, this could also, we don't have much context here, this could be an, a universal command, like, hey, when you come home every day, repeatedly, hang your hat on the hanger. Then we'd say vieshi. Okay, number seven, uh, don't stand on the edge of the platform. Okay, we're saying don't, basically don't be standing around on the edge of the train, uh, the, the platform. The platform is platforma. Okay, so, не стой на краю платформы. Okay, number eight, uh, don't put glasses near the computer. Okay, so, uh, okay, I, I thought for a moment that we were talking about achki, so, but no, these aren't um, uh, eyeglasses, these are glasses, cups. Okay, so if we put them near the computer, it's going to be into a standing position, right? So uh, don't put them near the computer. And okay, now what aspect are we going to use? Imperfective, presumably, because this is, sounds like something that's not a good idea, right? You might spill uh, water on your keyboard. Okay, so nestav, nestav, right? Imperfective, nestav. Stakani u computer. Okay, here's a, another quick note that uh, alas comes up more often than you might think in you know Russian history and literature and whatnot. Right, imprisonment. And again, we have another idiom in Russian. You 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 don't spend time in prison. You're not. You are not in prison. Rather, you sit in prison. Right. So that's the idiom. You sit in prison. Okay, and once we are aware of that basic idiom, we can use all of these various sitting position verbs to describe being in jail, being put in jail, entering jail, and so forth, right? So if we say that on ciel, it, it could mean that he sat down, he assumed a sitting position, or it can mean he got into prison. And, you know, this can, you don't even have to say into prison, like, like turmu, right? You may simply hear someone say, well, on ciel, and that can imply, again, it would depend on context, obviously, that he, he sat into prison, you could also say evil pasadili, meaning they placed him into a sitting position or they imprisoned him, they, they threw him in jail. And then after that happened, we could say on sidit, he is in a sitting position, right? He's sitting in prison, literally. So there's a painting, uh, and let's supply a little description. В картине слева мы видим одного заключенного, который стал на столик, чтобы смотреть в окошко. Okay, so in the painting to the left, we see a zaklucionli, um, which means someone who's been locked up, basically, a, a prisoner. Uh, we, so we see a prisoner, katori stal na stolik. Okay, there's a nice example, right? He, who has assumed a standing position onto a little table. You can't see it too well there. But we'd say in English, I guess, he's got up on, on, on the table. He got up on the table. He assumed a standing position onto the table. In order to look into, or we'd say in English, look out the little window. Uh, meanwhile, in the painting to the right, in the book, uh, right, so a katrznik, meaning someone who's been doing a penal labor, that is katrga in Siberia, has unexpectedly returned to his family. And it was quite often the case, both in imperi the imperial period, as in this painting, and also in Soviet times, that you know the return of a prisoner who you'd sort of written off and perhaps hope to forget about, right? It would obviously depend on the family dynamic and whatnot. It could be quite a shock and uh, a rather, I don't know, ambivalent situation emotionally when all of a sudden they, they came, they showed up out of nowhere, right? So th this painting is getting at that kind of, 
it doesn't seem that everyone in the house is just overjoyed to see whoever this has come home, right? Uh, so it's, it's an interesting, uh, maybe not quite what we would expect. Uh, okay, so again, a uh, katrznik is someone who's been sentenced to katrga or katrznaya rabota, and that is the term for forced labor in a Siberian penal colony. And that, of course, refers to katrga implies pre-Soviet uh, penal colonies, right? So the gulag, that acronym is something that the Soviets cooked up. So while it resembles in a lot of ways the uh, imperial uh, penal colony system, of course, it was much harsher and so forth, but it's kind of a separate thing. Okay, let's look at one more painting. This is a very famous portrait, Dievichka s Piersikami by Sirov. Uh, so a little girl with uh, peaches there on the table, a peaches of Piersik. Okay, this is really more kind of a free response uh, exercise, but let's ask the questions and make sure we're interpreting the verbs po- uh, properly, right, as we review all these position verbs. And you can think about possible answers. Кто здесь сидит перед нами? Какая она? So who is in a sitting position in front of us here? What kind of person is she? Okay, so we could say девочка. Девочка сидит перед нами. Number two, почему она села за стол? Why did she assume a sitting position behind the table, right? Why did she sit down at the table? Что она делает? What is she doing? Okay. Um, number three, куда она положила нож? Нож. Uh, где он лежит? Okay, to where did she place into a lying position the knife? Uh, where is it lying? Where is it in a lying position? Okay, so again, you see what kind of the problem here is, right? You see these verbs, and you may know, for example, number three, these both have to do with lying, but we have to be very careful to note the difference, right? Uh, being Placing something into the position or being in the position and so forth. What else is lying on the table, in a lying position on the table? Number five, To where did they place into a hanging position the plate, right? You see that decorative plate back there hanging on the wall? Okay, so we could say, Tarelko pavyesili na stienu, right? They they hung it, they placed it onto the wall. Gdia na visit, where is it hanging? Na stienia, right? It's hanging on the wall. Gdia. Uh, number six, što tako je skatirt? Abisni, what is a tablecloth? Explain. Okay, well, we could say it's a piece of cloth that one uh, spreads out on the table. We place it into a lying position onto the table right? Uh, so we could use kleist, right? We kladium skatirt na stol, right? We, we place it into a lying position onto the table. Skatirt ligit na stalia, it lies on the table. Okay, number seven, kuda pastavli svechu? Vy jo vidite? To where did they place into a standing position the candle? Do you see it? Yeah, it's barely, it's right on the, the, the far right, right in front of the uh, window, right, on a little table. So we could say, они поставили свечу на столик, or на стол. Восемь, куда поставили столик, на котором свеча стоит? To where did they place into a standing position the little table on which the candle is in a standing position? Okay, we could say here simply, uakna, they placed it near the window. And remember that that u doesn't make this kudagdia uh, distinction, right? So we could that could mean at the window, or here we could say they placed it into this position near the window. Let's see, number nine. Uh, what stands next to the table? Uh, well, I see a stool, right? Stool stayed riadam setim stolikum. Uh, what's standing behind the window or in the window, we'd say, outside the window. Well, you can't see very well, but I think it's trees, right? Okay, what about behind the door, or right on the other side of the door? Well, I see a stool, right, another chair, a stool, sorry, a stool. Uh, so we could say, stool right, there's a chair standing on the other side of the door. The doorway. Когда эта девочка встанет из-за стола? Okay, there's that idiom. When will this girl get up, right? And there's that special verb, get up from behind the table. 
Well, I don't really know. We can only speculate. Okay, number 12. Нельзя ли класть локти на стол? А ноги, как принято в твоей семье? Okay, isn't it not, right, нельзя ли, right, no, that kind of yes, no question, or kind of a rhetorical, well, it's not really rhetorical. Yeah, it's a yes, no question, right? Is it is it possible to put, uh, to, to place into a lying position, literally, your elbows onto the table? What about your feet? Uh, how are things done in your family? Okay, does your family... Uh, put their feet on the table at Thanksgiving dinner? I, I certainly hope not, right? But um, I guess uh, elbows is more of an open question. This girl's certainly putting her elbows on the table with no shame whatsoever. Okay, so anyway. Um, by the way, you do. I've heard that come up in Russia, like this whole thing of putting elbows on the table. And I think it's kind of like in the U.S. at least, where maybe as a kid you're sort of told not to do it and you shouldn't do it in some super formal thing. But it, it's not like anyone in Russia is going to get in your face because you put your elbows on the table. That's it for today. So that ends our discussion of uh, verbs of position. Uh, until next time, do свидания, товарищи.